Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be reading to you this book about Tikal, a big Mayan city in what is now Guatemala. So let's just dive right in. Tikal. This book is very wide, so it's going to be a little tricky to get all of it in a shot for you. But we start off with this cool map. Can see Tikal is right there, along with some of the other cities that we'll be talking about in the room. So let's just dive right in. The only sounds were the splash of paddles dipping into the water and the trickle as they were lifted forward, the droplets leaving brief wing outlines alongside the wooden hull. The paddlers worked in silence, weary from the tropical heat and the exertion. Mute bundles and baskets lay in ponderous heaps at the bottom of the huge canoe. This was no villager's boat bearing a day's catch of fish. This was a trading canoe, one of many that glided swiftly on the rivers of Central America, carrying goods of every sort from city to city. The canoe had set out on the Motagua River nearly a month before, laden with obsidian from mines near the city of Quirigua. The Yucatan Peninsula in the 7th century was a world without metals, so the black glass-like rock was in great demand. Chips of obsidian had razor-sharp edges that were used for everything from sculpting limestone to piercing the flesh of enemies. The paddlers guided the canoe down the Motagua to the Caribbean Sea and then traveled north along the coast. Turning inland again, they struggled against the current as they made their way up the Homo River, deeper into the jungles of the Peten. Eventually, the jungle grew less dense. They saw more cleared fields and occasionally clusters of buildings. Finally, in the distance, they could make out a tall pyramid towering over the landscape. They paddled faster at the sight, for it meant they were nearing their destination. The pyramid marked the heart of the great Maya city of Tikal. They go paddling until they spot the pyramid among many others. The Maya had once lived along the Caribbean coast, but around 1200 BCE they migrated inland to the Paten. It was a forbidding wilderness of rolling hills and tangled rainforest. Jaguars and poisonous snakes lay in wait for the unwary and jungle plants were always ready to reclaim cleared farmland. Floods and droughts, heat and insects, were part of the hard, dangerous life. Still, the Maya survived. They hunted deer in the jungle, caught snails to the bajos, I think, the lowland swamps, and harvested wild plants. They built homes on high ground above the swamp waters and cleared fields by cutting trees in the jungle and burning them during the dry season. They planted maize, beans, and squashes for a dependable food supply. The Maya were a brilliant people, and against all odds, deep in the jungle, they developed a sophisticated civilization. They studied the world around them and learned about everything from astronomy and mathematics to farming and architecture. They developed a beautiful written language of glyphs, written, written symbols, which scribes used to capture their knowledge in books on pages made of tree bark. They measured the passage of days and years with remarkably precise calendars. Their religion was rich in exciting myths and powerful gods and that richness was reflected in their paintings and stone carvings. The Maya thrived. Small villages grew to become grand cities with populations numbering in the tens of thousands. There were nearly 100 cities in the Paten, and they were alike in many ways. They shared a common religion, language, and knowledge. They were linked to each other through trade and through marriage, but each was unmistakably a separate kingdom loyal to its own ahau or king, using its own style of art and architecture, and seeking its own wealth. Tikal was settled in 800 BCE, later than the other cities, but it was
was one of the first to become large and wealthy. It was built on a limestone ridge that jutted up between two enormous bajos. Its location was the key to its great success. Trade was the lifeblood of Mesoamerica. Luxuries. Green jade from the Sierra de las Minas. Exotic ceramic pots from Mexico. Seashells and coral from the Caribbean as well as humble necessities like salt and avocados moved constantly around the Yucatan. Whether they were destined for cities within the Petén or for more far-flung places in Mesoamerica, all goods traveled across the Yucatan by river. One network of rivers flowed east into the Caribbean Sea, and another flowed west into the Gulf of Mexico, but there was no continuous river route that went all the way across the peninsula. To get from one river system to the other, traders had to unload the canoes and carry the goods on their backs through the jungle. Tikal was, a unique was in a unique position to take advantage of the overland part of the traders' journey. The city sat squarely on its ridge in the middle of one of the few passable overland routes between the east-flowing and west-flowing rivers. All goods being carried between the river systems had to pass through the city, and Tikal charged dearly for that privilege. That was the source of the city's wealth and power. Awesome artwork. We'll look at it in a second. Tikal prospered and grew. New buildings, always grander than the ones they replaced, were raised upon the ruins of the old, and then they too were knocked down and built upon. The center of Tikal was the highest part of the city. It was also the oldest, and it was crowded with palaces and pyramids. They were built of limestone blocks, and the walls were coated with limestone plaster. The walls were decorated with elaborate carvings and glyphs, and then painted a brilliant shade of red. The nobility lived in an area called the Central Acropolis, in stone palaces with thick walls, narrow rooms, and high-peaked roofs. Soft skins of jaguars made the limestone beds considerably more comfortable, and servants made their lives easy. Check out how magnificently red all the buildings were. Very, very cool. The tops of the pyramids all decorated. Make sure I'm not skipping any pages. Weaving, and cooking, playing, with the big pyramids in the background. I'm going to slide this over here so you can see. Tikal was not as crowded beyond the city center, but it sprawled for miles in every direction. Clusters of houses sat atop smaller limestone hills that poked up from the Bajos. Some belonging to wealthy families were made of limestone. Many more were made of thin wooden poles lashed together with vines and coated with plaster. Fronds from guano palms were used for the roof. They were not as sturdy as stone houses, but a new one could be built in just days. The central courtyards were alive with the dogs, turkeys, and stingless honeybees that the Maya raised. Children raced around the cooking fires. Kneeling women rocked back and forth as they ground maize on metate smooth stones with manos and held grinding stones. Weavers passed shuttles back and forth across looms strung with bright cotton threads, creating beautifully patterned fabric. Palms, avocado trees, squashes, and peppers grew near the houses, and containers of beer fermented in choltoons or small chambers dug into the limestone bedrock. Beyond the houses were fields planted with maize. Look at it in a second. Let's read this first. As Tikal became wealthy and powerful, it was inevitable that it would draw the envy and resentment of its neighbors. Among the Maya, such resentment could lead to only one thing war. Warfare was a way of life in the Peten. Cities, some barely a day's walk apart, often fought savagely with one another. Sometimes they fought for wealth. Conquerors could profit handsomely by demanding payments, called tribute, from the defeated city. Sometimes they fought for religious reasons. 
Offering human blood to their gods was an important part of Maya religion. Enemies captured in battle were used for the sacrifices. If a noble was captured, so much the better. Their blood was more valuable to the gods. Astronomers watched the skies and consulted their books. When the planet Venus was in the right position in the heavens, war began. Warriors in bright feathered costumes attacked with spears, hatchets, and stone clubs. If a king was captured, the fighting ended abruptly, but war sometimes lasted for years. Warfare was such an important part of my life that even games took on a warlike seriousness, particularly their ball game. It was a rough sport played with a massive black rubber ball in a stone court. Players had to keep the ball in play without touching it with hands or feet. They wore thick padding to keep their ribs from being shattered by the heavy, fast-moving ball. The game was dangerous for ordinary players, but it was even worse for enemy captives when they were forced to play as part of the ritual of sacrifice. Then the penalty for losing was beheading. So check this out. They are... Sorry, I have an itch on my nose. You can see where the bands are wrapped around them so they can hit the ball with those. The cool headdresses, probably showing what team is which. <laughs> like bird team versus deer team or something. These are their legs so they can hit it with their, um, their legs like that, not their feet, of course. And a big ol' heavy rubber ball and everybody watching. Paten was rarely at peace, and alliances between cities were constantly shifting. Wars were fought, friends became bitter enemies, and new alliances were formed. The cities of Caracal, Calakmul, and Dos Pilas, envious and probably a little frightened of their mighty neighbor, formed just such an alliance in the 6th century. In 562, Tikal suffered a humiliating defeat at their hands. Tikal's Ahau, double bird, was captured, tortured, and sacrificed in Dos Pilas. Humbled, Tikal was forced to make tribute payments of food, ceramics, and cacao beans to its conquering neighbors. Human tribute was demanded as well. Artists, scribes, craftspeople, and laborers from Tikal were forced to work in the enemy cities. Double bird's son, Animal Skull, was allowed to become a Hau of Tikal, but he was king in name only. In truth, he was powerless. The defeat marked the beginning of the darkest period in Tikal's long history. The marketplace grew quiet as trade was diverted to enemy cities. Tikal was impoverished. No grand palaces or pyramids were built during Animal Skull's reign, nor during the reigns of the three Ahaus who came after him. Worst of all, these helpless kings were not allowed to perform the religious rituals and sacrifices that were so necessary to keep Tikal in harmony with its gods. For people who looked to hundreds of different gods for everything from plentiful rainfall to successful beekeeping, this must have been a cruel blow. It wasn't until more than a century later that a leader would emerge who was strong enough to lead Tikal to its former greatness see some people here being captured by these warriors. They're most likely going to be sacrificed, right? Let's see what happens next. That leader was Hasal Chankawil. He was the son of Shield Skull, the last of the four Ahaus who had ruled Tikal during the Time of Darkness. Shield Skull was the only one of the four who had fought to free Tikal from its conquerors. His courage was great, but his efforts are not enough. He was captured following a battle in Dos Pilas and sacrificed, leaving Hassau next in line for the throne. Hassau was a majestic figure, taller than his people by a head, and beautiful by Maya standards. Thanks to the boards that had pressed his head when he was an infant, his forehead was regally flattened. The small ball that had been hung inches in front of his tiny face had done its work too, his eyes had focused on it and now were crossed fetchingly above his long, magnificently hooked nose. He wore his feathered, ceremonial garments with the dignity and bearing of one who had been raised to rule. 
Shield School had taught his son well. Displaying a wisdom beyond his years, Hassau moved slowly and without fanfare as he took his father's place. He knew that he ruled only with the permission of Tikal's enemies. He proceeded cautiously, but he turned his every effort toward continuing his father's struggle to restore Tikal. Even the somber work of burying his beloved father became a part of that effort. So here is a portrait of him as he was depicted, I assume, in Tikal. Obviously the actual one would be very elaborate. Feel bad doing that, but he snores really, really loud. Alright. Big, big pyramids. Look at him up at the top. I went down below. Let's read about them. In the spring of 682, Hassau Chankawil looked out over the crowds gathered in the great plaza from the steps of the newly completed pyramid. Deep within the solid stone was his father's tomb. The pyramid was the first large-scale building project to be attempted in Tikal since 562. It was taller than anything that had ever been built before in Tikal or anywhere in the Paten. The temple at its top, reached by a single dizzyingly steep staircase, appeared to float in the heavens. As Hassau had intended, it was awe-inspiring, a fitting memorial to his great love for his father. And as he had also intended, it was more than a memorial. In keeping with the Maya way of raising new structures upon the old, Hassau built his father's pyramid temple on the ruins of the tomb of an earlier Ahau, Stormy Sky. Nearly 250 years before, Stormy Sky had led Tikal in battle against an enemy invader from Mexico. The story of his victory had become an important Maya legend. By carefully choosing where and how he built his father's pyramid, Hassau sent a clear message to his people. Using the language of limestone, he told them that as Ahau, he would lead the city, just as Stormy Sky had, to victory and wealth. It was a message that must have been eagerly received in a city that had suffered for so long. Hassau's message was not one that Tikal's enemies wanted to hear. The rival cities were not eager to give up the tribute they had grown accustomed to, and they certainly didn't welcome Tikal as a trading rival. Hassau had to speak to his enemies in another way. He chose the harsher language of blood. As a grieving son, Hassau's first impulse must have been to strike at Dos Pilas and avenge his father's death. As a ruler, he was too wise to rush into such an action. Vengeance may have tempted the young Ahau, but he had to place the good of Tikal above his own desires. And so he waited and planned. When the time was right to go to war, he didn't attack those pilas. Instead, in a brilliant strategic move, he sent his soldiers to the north to attack the mightiest of all Tikal's enemies, Kalakmul. Defeating Dos Pilas would have avenged his father's death, but only by defeating Kalak Mul could he destroy the enemy alliance forever. It was not an easy victory. The bitter fighting went on for many years. At last, in 692, Kalak Mul was defeated and the alliance broke apart. The troubled times were over for Tikal. Free of its enemies after 130 years, the city could prosper once again. Here's the battlefield, people getting jabbed by the big long spears, ready to fight for their cities. Ooh, look at these. We've got a cacao cup for some yummy hot chocolate. This is also on the cup, or various other cups. Let's read about this. I'm excited. Hassau led Tikal to greatness that was unheard of even during the years of stormy sky. Giant trade canoes traveled the rivers, and the marketplace was again crowded and busy. 
the South strengthened Tikal by forming alliances with other cities. He invited nobles and kings to Tikal and won them over with lavish feasts and dancing. He offered his guests chocolate beverages made of fermented cacao beans and <laughs> an important gesture. So it wasn't hot chocolate, it was fermented hot chocolate. Ooh. Cacao was so precious that the beans were used as a kind of money by the Maya. Offering it as a drink was an impressive way of showing off Tikal's wealth. It's like those steaks with the, the gold leaves on. <laughs> the ceramic cups the cacao were served in were just as impressive. They were decorated with beautifully painted pictures and glyphs that proclaimed the glory of Tikal and its powerful Ahau. Hassa presented the cups to his guests as gifts. When they left, they took home with them a vivid reminder of all that was wonderful and fearful about Tikal and its great king. That's really awesome. Big old pyramid, the three to power. And Hassau continued to build, changing the face of the city with each new structure. When Hassau's wife, Lady Twelve Macaw, died, it was a painful loss for the young king. He built a remarkable pyramid to honor her memory. It was even taller and steeper than the one he had built for Shield Skull. He placed it in the Great Plaza instead of in the crowded North Acropolis where royalty had always been buried. Lady Twelve Macaw's pyramid stood alone in that nearly empty sacred space, a unique and dramatic monument. The temple that sat on top of Lady Twelve Macaw's pyramid was itself topped with a roof comb, a high wall of limestone. Carved into the roof comb was an enormous relief of Lady Twelve Macaw's face. Later, when Hassau's own pyramid was built at the opposite end of the Great Plaza, his face was carved into the roof comb of its temple also. As Hassau had planned, he and his beloved queen could gaze at each other across the plaza for all eternity. It kind of reminds me of like the Taj Mahal, right? A big, big building for your beloved one, for your queen. Big, big pyramids. Very squeaky book. <laughs> working hard. Let's find out what they're up to. There we go. Just west of the North Acropolis, Hassau built an unusual group of structures, a twin pyramid group. It was not built to honor a person, but to honor time. Time was sacred to the Maya. It was so important that they used two different calendars to mark the passing of every day and every year. The number 20 also had great significance. The Maya numbering system was based on 20 instead of on 10 as ours is. The end of a 20-year period, a katun, was therefore an event of great importance, and it was greeted with elaborate festivities. All Maya cities celebrated katun endings, but the building of twin pyramid groups for the occasion happened only in Tikal. Hassau's son and grandson continued the tradition after his death, building larger and larger twin pyramid groups. In the end, there were seven such groups in Tikal. The platform beneath the largest one covered nearly five acres. So you can see here they are constructing pyramids. It looks like here they're shaping the bricks, and here they're putting them into place. Or they're getting some clay to plant them so that they'll stay intact. And look, they're painting it red. Oh, that's beautiful. Let's find out what this is. Dancing and feasting were a part of the cartoon ending celebrations. But there was a more serious side as well. Sacrifices were made to the gods, and the blood that was shed during these rituals were not always that of enemy captives. Maya religious devotion was so strong that kings and queens, nobles, heads of ordinary families, men and women alike, willingly sacrificed their own blood to honor the gods. The bloodletting was not fatal, but it must have been very painful. 
A Maya queen, for example, would pull a thorn-studded cord across her tongue until it bled. The queen allowed her blood to spill onto strips of bark paper in a ceramic bowl until she was too weak to continue. Then the blood-soaked paper was mixed with copal, a black tar-like resin set on fire. As it burned, the aromatic smoke curled upward to the waiting gods. So this is what that depicts. Look, she's running the cord over her tongue, letting it. You're trying to can see the thorns. Ooh, I don't like to think about that. That makes me. That makes my skin crawl. <laughs> Ooh, we got a story within a story. Let's see. Two very my important. Two very my important gods. Two very important Maya gods. I'm not crazy, that's what it says. Were the hero twins. Their story tells of the creation of the Maya world. In the time of darkness, I'll whisper this to you as that. In the time of darkness, before the world began. Let me move my mic a little closer so you can really hear the mouth sounds during the story. In the time of darkness, before the world began, two gods, the twins. normally again. That's a great story. Hassau felt strongly connected to the myth of the hero twins. He saw similarly, he saw a similarity between himself and the twin gods. He had used his wits and courage to end Tikal's years of enemy oppression, just as they had ended the time of darkness. He chose to build ceremonial ball courts to honor the two there we go. And here they are. This is on a cacao cup, it says. That's Hunapu. <laughs> Sorry, I got That's Hunapu and that's Shibalanke. Playing the ball game. That's really cool. Oh, okay. Here's where it's going to get really good. 
We're going to read this first. And then there's a surprise. Here we go. Contain yourself. Let's read this first. As remarkable as it was, Hassau's reign was just the beginning of the most extraordinary century in Tikal's 1500-year history. His son, Yikin Chankawil, and his grandson, Yakshain II, were also strong rulers. They continued to dominate other cities in battle. They captured prisoners and spilled their blood and sacrifices to the gods. They controlled trade in the Paten, increasing Tikal's wealth. Like Hassau, their most lasting marks were left in limestone. The twin pyramid groups that they had built for Katun endings were all enormous projects. And there were others as well, beginning with Hassau's burial pyramid which Yakin built in the Great Plaza, according to his father's wishes. They built a total of four gigantic single pyramids. The tallest one stood over 21 stories tall. Although they built many ceremonial structures, the two Hows didn't neglect the daily business of the city. Yakin constructed a large permanent marketplace east of the Great Plaza. He and Yakshain II widened the raised causeways that led to it, paving them with plaster and building walls on both sides. The magnificent sweeping causeways provided visiting traders with a memorable entrance into Tikal, and, since the only entrance was through narrow, easily guarded gates, the causeways gave Tikal's rulers control over everything that came into the market. Here we can see the marketplace. Everything for sale out here. We've got, oh, I wonder if that's the uh, how. A big crown being carried here. And looks like lots of fruits and vegetables for sale, maybe even some birds. All right, let me show you the surprise. We have a big fold out map of Tikal. Now, this is huge. I do not know how I'm going to show it all to you. I'll just have to slide it back and forth. It's going to mess up my lighting because it's so big. But you know what? It's a beautiful, beautiful map. <sighs> you know, I don't know how I'm going to get this in frame for you. So let's just check it out. So we have the Great Plaza right here. Number two is the Stelle. Uh, number two, do you see number two, number two, number two? See, this map is just so big. I don't know how I'm going to get all of this in. Um, number two is right here. <laughs> Boom. Those are the stele. that have important events carved onto them. This is the North Acropolis. And then number four is Shield Skull's Pyramid. Number five. Over here is Lady Twelve Macaw's Burial Pyramid, and this is Hassau's Burial Pyramid. We have the, let's see, let's see, over here, the Central Acropolis. The Twin Pyramid groups we can see in the back over here. You can see them right here, Twin Pyramids. This is one of seven, it says. And then we have another twin pyramid group right over here. And then we have number 10 is way over here, <laughs> way over here. <laughs> this was built by Yakshin II, the last of the seven and the largest pyramid. And then we have some reservoirs, it says right here, right in the middle, um, to supply water during the dry season. And then down here, we can see, oh my goodness, a ball court right here that was built by Hassau. And then right next to it is the big marketplace. This would be the causeway they talked about, the only entrance in, so you walk in and you're just greeted by these huge pyramids. 
And then over here in the distance, you see people's homes. So that's, I think, the best. I'm going to get this giant map and frame. It's so huge. It's bigger than my desk. <laughs> I can't even hold it onto my whole computer desk. It's so big. But yeah, that's a fantastic map. I could look at that all day. So let's start wrapping up the story of the Maya. There seemed to be no end to the glory of Tikal during the reigns of these three great Ahals. The population was higher than it had ever been, construction was going on at an amazing pace, and Tikal was the most powerful city in the Paten. And yet the glorious years did end, unexpectedly, completely, and mysteriously. People died and others moved away. Trade stopped, building stopped. The last Stella was carved in 830. Kings, if there were any, left no traces in limestone to mark their passing. The city was abandoned, and the jungle swiftly reclaimed the silent fields and temples and markets. Barely 100 years after the reign of Yagshain II, Tikal had fallen into a time of darkness from which it would never recover. The mystery of what happened in Tikal has intrigued archaeologists for a century and a half. Many fascinating theories have been suggested to explain why Tikal collapsed at the height of its wealth and power. One theory suggests that hunger may have destroyed Tikal. The elaborate building projects of Asao and his descendants took many farmers out of their fields and put them to work on construction. The constant warfare took more farmers from their maize crops and sent them to attack neighboring cities. Builders and soldiers were not producing food, but they and their families still needed to eat. As strange as it may seem, it's possible. Sorry, after it. As strange as it may seem, it's possible that in a time of apparent prosperity, there simply wasn't enough food for everyone. Another theory suggests that a change in canoeing led to Tikal's end. For many centuries, Maya canoes and their paddlers were no match for long trips out on the open ocean. That is why the river routes across the peninsula were so important. It may have been that, as boats and boating skills improved, travel by ocean became possible. If traders could move goods by sea all the way from Copan, say, to profitable markets in Mexico, they would have chosen to do so. If there was no overland carrying, no jungle dangers, no relentless river currents. And if traders no longer passed through Tikal, the city's main source of wealth would have been lost. Earthquake, drought, and disease are also possible reasons for the collapse, but no single theory or combination of theories has ever been proven. See the pyramids decaying here in the jungle. It's still very beautiful, but a little sad. Remember the glory days, the big market and everything. Very sad. And the mystery extends far beyond Tikal. It was not the only Maya city to be abandoned in the 9th century. Cities throughout the Paten, large and powerful, small and weak, suffered the same fate at the same time. They too grew silent and soon disappeared in the jungle growth. We still don't know what happened in the Paten a thousand years ago, and we may never know. Many years later, in 1502, Christopher Columbus reported seeing large trading canoes in the waters off the Yucatan Peninsula. They were apparently the canoes of the Maya, who had left the Paten centuries before, and established cities on the northern Yucatan coast to take advantage of the new ocean trading routes. Not long after, Spanish explorers arrived in the Yucatan looking for gold and for converts to Christianity. They found no gold, and the Maya were resistant to their religion, so they moved on. The diseases they carried with them lingered, and many Maya died. The cities on the Yucatan coast were soon abandoned, just as those in the Paten had been. It wasn't until the 19th century that the next European visitors arrived, drawn by rumors of lofty pyramids in the Paten. They slashed through the tangled jungle to find the ruins, and 
they marveled at the people who had built them. They couldn't read the glyphs on the stele and cacao cups they found, so they relied on their imaginations to tell the story of the Maya. Yeah, that's what I was talking about in yesterday's video. They imagined a gentle people, led by scholarly priests, who moved softly through the perpetual rituals of worship and planting that defined their days. They imagined a people without kings or warfare or bloodshed, living contentedly in a peaceful world. This appealing picture of the Maya was accepted as truth for decades. In the last 50 years, though, this story has been questioned. Beginning in the ruins of Tikal, scholars have been exploring Maya buildings, translating glyphs, and studying artwork. Thanks to their years of work, the Maya are no longer nameless, faceless jungle dwellers. They have become real people. We know about their wars and about their legends. Great leaders like Stormy Sky and Hassal Chankawil and his descendants have taken shape for us as complicated, real people who loved and celebrated, sacrificed and fought. And here is an actual photograph of Tikal, not a drawing. So you can see here the two pyramids for Hassau and his wife. The big acropolis back here. It's so beautiful, the stele. Ugh, amazing. That must be an incredible, incredible sight to see. Look how intact the pyramid is. So gorgeous. That's the end of our book tonight. Did you not love that book? I love this book. There's a bunch of other books in the series. You can see for Panama Canal, the Great Wall of China, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Hoover Dam, Machu Picchu, the Roman Colosseum. Great Pyramid right there. So maybe I'll have to find those other Wonders of the World books because this one was really wonderful, don't you think? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night.